If you were to visit the Petri Museum with infrared vision, you would probably be drawn to wildly different parts of the collection than you would normally. Certain artifacts would appear to glow before your very eyes. This is because of the inventively named pigment Egyptian blue, which as the name tells you, is a blue pigment that was commonly used in Egypt. However, Egyptian blue has a special property that makes it stand out from the rest. When illuminated in visible light, it fluoresces infrared light. If you could see infrared light, you would see all of the artifacts that contain this pigment glowing. This was a quote from an article describing the amazing electromagnetic properties of a pigment used extensively in ancient Egypt. The Egyptian blue pigment has been analyzed by modern science to determine its constituents, but at present no written recipe for it has been found. Some additional information posits that researchers at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory discovered that the Egyptian blue pigment absorbs visible light and emits light in the near infrared range. Therefore, it could be used in the construction materials designed to cool rooftops as well as walls in sunny climates. It could also be used for tinting glass to improve photovoltaic cell performance. But this incredible pigment is not the only Egyptian product that has been found to interact with electromagnetism. It says here that the shape of the pyramid focuses electromagnetic energy in its internal chambers and under its base, creating higher levels of energy. The results can be applied to design nanoparticles capable of reproducing similar focusing effects in the optical range. Such nanoparticles can be used as the building blocks for construction of optical devices for the management of light energy at the nanoscale and can help to be a source of renewable energy in the future. It also says that the unusual electromagnetic properties of the pyramid are almost certainly just a coincidence of its structure as it is highly unlikely that the ancient Egyptians knew anything about this. As we can see, the idea that the ancient Egyptians could have possibly had their own theories of quantum mechanics, particle physics, and electromagnetism is utterly ridiculous to some. But is it really? Because we only need to consider the size, complexity, and precision of the pyramids and other megaliths to get but a small glimpse of the exceptional imaginative ability and problem-solving capabilities of the ancient intellect. We must also keep in mind that it will be a significant challenge for us to replicate the Great Pyramid today, over 5,000 years later. So if their concept of the quantum realm in any way parallels their astounding concepts of masonry and architecture, then it might have in some ways have even rivaled our own understanding. And if so, then what will have been the core tenets of this theory? To tackle this question, let's take a brief hypothetical journey into the ancient mind, starting with the very basics. An ancient quantum theory would begin just as any other theory, by observation, imagination, logic, and modeling. We can imagine the ancient philosophers and proto-physicists looking up into the heavens and in their surroundings, humbly attempting to grasp the vast differences in the sizes of objects. They would see that there are unfathomably large objects in the heavens, such as the sun and moon, and such as the mountains and oceans on earth. They would also see that there are very tiny objects, such as grains of sand. They might then surmise that there are even larger objects in the heavens than those that they can see. In a similar revelation that there might likewise be objects much smaller than those they can see. And that perhaps all visible objects, no matter how large or how small, are made up of these objects that are too small to see. What we would call the subdivisions of matter. They might further surmise that as tiny specks of sand can float in the air, but eventually fall back to the ground that perhaps there are even smaller objects than sand that are so small and so light that they never fall to the ground. 
they might eventually come to the conclusion that light itself is made up of these invisibly small objects and or particles. And what if they later concluded that all objects, all matter, is simply immense conglomerations of these particles, and by extension, conglomerations of light? Interestingly, it has long been held by modern science that photons can create matter, a belief which has recently been proven true in the laboratory. But just as with any conglomerations of visible particles, these invisible particles can be accumulated, directed, and perhaps even changed from one state to the other, just as water can change state from liquid to vapor under the right conditions. Following this line of thinking, the Egyptians and other ancient civilizations could well have developed a rudimentary quantum theory. A theory which would have become more and more developed and complex over the ensuing centuries, with better models super superseding the previous. It is the same process we use in science today. Whether it was as advanced as modern quantum or string, string theory is relatively irrelevant, pardon the pun. Regardless of how correct it was, it would have given the ancients a model to work with. Models lead to predictability and can therefore lead to some measure of control over outcomes in many cases. In other words, they lead to the practical application of science or technology. Even our own modern science is incomplete. We have yet to bridge the, the gap between quantum mechanics and relativity, for instance. We understand and contest gravity at the macro level, but not the micro level. The last quantum carrier of gravitational force, the graviton, if it exists, has proven elusive. Yet both the models of quantum mechanics and relativity have allowed us to make tremendous strides in both further theoretical as well as practical use. But how could this hypothetical ancient quantum science enable the development of a pyramid and a pigment with the aforementioned electromagnetic properties? One of the many interesting ideas from Philadelphia inventor John Ward Keeley is that according to author Del Pond in his book, Universal Laws Never Before Revealed, a vibrating object actually sheds particles of itself into its surroundings. In other words, sound, just as light, consists of minute particles which travel in waves. We might call these derivative particles. According to the book, Free Energy Pioneer, by author Theo Pagemans, Keeley did not work alone, but was connected to an extensive occult underground in the late 1800s. A network which in turn may have conveyed some metaphysical concepts to him, concepts preserved and passed down from antiquity. The concept of these sound particles is somewhat different from what we understand as phonons, the quantum representation of sound and heat. Phonons are quasi-particles that are said to only exist within the medium through which they travel. Photons, by contrast, can travel indefinitely throughout a vacuum. But if Keeley is correct, then these derivative sound particles can also travel through a vacuum to some degree. Also, according to Keeley, via Del Pond, this outpouring of particles, if the object were left to resonate indefinitely, would eventually lose its physical form and disintegrate into its subatomic constituents, though this pro process would require an immense amount of time. I haven't yet found much modern evidence corroborating Keeley's claim. Significant propagation of phonons through a vacuum is largely disputed by modern science, although recent theoretical formulations have predicted that they can tunnel a small distance through a vacuum with the aid of quantum fluctuations of electromagnetic fields, known as the Casimir force. It is a question as to whether or not Keeley's concept of derivative particles can be modeled as phonons as we know them. But even if this concept were found to be incorrect, we can see how such a model or one like it could still grant a startling degree of insight into the behavior 
and properties of photons and electromagnetism, especially if that model represented sound and light as either the same or facets of the one underlying principle or force. We can see this in the summum principle of vibration in which different forms of matter and different forms of energy are seen only as differentiated by their rates of vibration. We know for a fact that almost all major ancient civilizations had a highly developed and in some cases astonishing understanding of acoustic resonance and how it is affected by geometry. And so if they did envision sound and light as fundamentally the same and both as made up of minute particles, then they would indeed have, have been able to create a structure which focused and amplified not only sound, but electromagnetic energy as well. We could see them coming to the realization that these particles which make up sunlight could be absorbed by certain substances exposed to the sun. A short time later, these particles could then be seemingly felt as a curious sensation of heat. Their own extensive experimentation will show that certain substances achieve this interesting conversion effect better than others. And as we know, any object with a temperature above absolute zero emits infrared radiation. This should sound very familiar because it is the very property possessed by the Egyptian blue pigment mentioned at the beginning. Interestingly, sound also produces heat. And as with light, sound can also be absorbed and then re-released as heat and hence infrared radiation. We could imagine the Egyptian striking a tuning fork in the air, seeing how it caused a similar tuning fork to resonate without any obvious physical medium or contact, and then concluding that the fork must send parts of itself through the air to affect the other, especially if tuned to the same frequency. Hence, we can certainly see how an early people might surmise that any source of light or sound exerts physical forces by emanating particles of itself into its surroundings. At present, modern science explains the tuning fork experiments in terms of particles of air being pushed and pulled by the source, and as being the sole medium of transmission for sound between vibrating objects. But again, the Keelian or ancient model is still quite logical in this concept and could have led to a practical awareness of particle behavior in antiquity. And as our own understanding and insight grows, we may ultimately see clear evidence of this minute sonic radiation of a source's particle makeup as being a contributor to resonant energy transfer. So we can see that, contrary to popular belief, that it, it is indeed very possible, even likely, for the Egyptians to have had a very real understanding of what we know of it as electromagnetism, particle physics, and quantum mechanics. Though of course they will have had their own names for these concepts and will have utilized them in markedly different ways than we do today, especially since they didn't tend to separate spirituality and science as we do. Whether their model was as advanced as ours or much more rudimentary, it's not very important. The important part is that they, it would have enabled them to conceptualize and contextualize the universe in ways which made sense to them within their cultural confines. As finite beings, humans do not possess absolute knowledge. Instead, we develop models which allow us to apply logic to conditions and events and to even predict them in ways that are significantly better than random probability or wishful thinking. Models developed by observations, experiments, and deductions. And as we come to know more, these models are superseded by better and more inclusive models, which in turn allow better predictions, more skillful manipulations, and even a better degree of control in many instances. As an example, we see how meteorology and the atmospheric sciences allow us to predict the weather with increasing accuracy as our understanding grows, even how we might someday be able to responsibly influence the weather. In summary, 
even though modern science sees sound and light as two separate entities, there are still parallels significant enough that models could be created to incorporate the properties of both. For instance, both can be represented as quantum particles that travel in a wave-like pattern. Both can be absorbed and re-emitted as heat and infrared radiation. And both can exert physical forces of attraction, repulsion, and propulsion. And so it will have become obvious to them that certain materials and geometries would affect both in similar ways. And this may very well have been something the Egyptians realized and that could have worked for them even if they didn't see light and sound as different as we do. Hence their understanding of sound vibration could very well have given them a practical understanding of electromagnetism and quantum phenomena almost by default and with no need for an electron microscope or other space age equipment. Instead, they employed the nearly limitless power of imagination, consistent modeling and logical thinking faculties that we still rely on 5,000 years plus later. Thus we can see almost step by step how their own theories of quantum mechanics and particle physics could have been developed over centuries. The original premise being the stratification of object sizes and the realization that all objects, no matter how large or how small, are made up of even smaller objects. Some of their models may have led to the applications that even we today have yet to realize, hence leading to a few mysteries we still ponder today of a people well ahead of the time that history stubbornly attempts to keep them in. We can see this with some of the more unconventional ideas concerning the Great Pyramid itself. Was it indeed a type of energy machine or power plant, but just not in the way that we think of today? In a future video, we will explore this fascinating idea further. Until then, thanks for watching, and as always, stay tuned.